Hello and welcome to the Medicine Matters Diabetes Podcast. I'm Eleanor McDermott. This year marks the 25th anniversary of the EASD's Psychosocial Aspects of Diabetes Study Group, or the PSAD. In the coming weeks, we'll be bringing you interviews with experts in the field, highlighting some of the most critical aspects of psychosocial research and care. But to kick off, we're talking to Professor Frank Schnook from the Amsterdam University Medical Centre in the Netherlands about the history and achievements of the PSAD. Frank founded the group in 1995 and was its first chairperson. Congratulations on 25 years of the PSAD. Well, thank you. Yeah. So I read your outline of the history of the group in your review in Diabetic Medicine Journal, and you highlighted the rather lukewarm response you had when you were trying to set it up initially. How do you feel that attitudes have changed since then? Um, well, that's that's a tricky question, actually, because um, I would say in general, the acceptance, the acknowledgement that psychology plays a major role in diabetes has grown um, and or increased. Um, at the same time, I think that in certain professional organizations, and particularly the EASD, there are individual um, investigators, uh, known researchers who work very closely together with psychologists who have a, um, a lot of sympathy for the area, who acknowledge the importance, while others uh, do not necessarily connect to this field. And this is somewhat different, I believe, if you look at, uh, for, com- you know, for comparison, if you look at the American Diabetes Association, where it has had more uh, a longer tradition, and it seems to be more broadly accepted. So whether this is a European thing versus the <laughs> the United States, I don't know. Um, but certainly in the past 25 years, um, as I said, the recognition has grown substantially. And I think this is also due to the uh, excellent, um, um, you know, the contributions of the, uh, of the in- individual researchers in this area. I think we've made much progress. So you um, started out with a three-part mission statement, the first of which was to stimulate communication between researchers in the field of psychosocial aspects of diabetes. So how did you set about this and what have you achieved? Um, yeah, so we we established this study group and the first thing that we um, uh, set out was to have annual meetings um, and we preferred spring meetings, <laughs> one of the best seasons obviously, and to be honest, we preferred to have meetings in the southern part of Europe, if that was <laughs> at all possible. Um, but these uh, spring meetings, who've become a tradition, have been very uh, instrumental in, in helping to promote the communication between researchers across Europe and actually across the Atlantic. Um, and it has attracted younger researchers as well as senior researchers, and that mix uh, has shown to be very productive, uh, very much appreciated. Also, as a formal study group, we were able to uh, communicate on on another level, and that's that we um, well we had some impact on agenda setting when it comes to international meetings, etc. So having a face uh, m- means that you can jointly communicate externally much more effectively. But uh, uh, setting up these meetings and they are still running and they're still very successful, I think was the major achievement. How many people approximately do you get coming to these meetings? Um, we limit the number of meetings uh, to about 40. Um, so we still consider it a small group meeting, although <laughs> you could debate that. But that's because we we uh, we very much want to promote interaction and a very informal uh, atmosphere. Um, we know that larger meetings uh, will be appreciated uh, by many people because uh, more people can profit from what's going on there. But at the same time, it we've been very cautious in expanding the um, um, the meetings in terms of, of participants. So it's about 40. And the second part of the mission statement was to improve the quality of psychosocial research in diabetes. How do you feel you've done with that? Well, it, I think it's a bit, you know, it, it, it would be very arrogant to say that we've achieved it, uh, but we, we do think we've made a major contribution. 
and again, this comes to connecting um, the researchers across Europe and the US actually and Australia um, and by connecting um, people learn from each other um, they uh, were sometimes pretty isolated uh, one psychologist at a department who had an interest in diabetes well their colleagues were working on oncology or cardiology and it's really really helpful to have your friends across the world and it really speeds up the whole process of uh, hypothesis development and the quality of the research. So I think PSED has been instrumental in getting people together um, and to connect and by that um, also sharing information much more quickly and it, it certainly has um, stimulated academic careers in, in, in uh, quite a large group of people who were 25 years ago, at least they consider themselves pretty young and are now senior researchers and doing really well. And so I think it's a combination of having these group meetings and getting together, but also uh, beyond the meetings, the physical meetings, uh, connecting and, and sharing information. And uh, that has been really helpful. Um. Is it particularly tough to get funding for psychosocial research? Yes, that's a very good question. Uh, it is. Um, and, of course, it is difficult for many researchers. So, I mean, that's all in the game. It's a competitive area. Um, but we've been struggling in different countries with uh, having at least some dedicated funding for behavioral psychosocial research. That has been... Uh, a struggle. Uh, in some countries, there's just no no mechanism, no no scheme, no program, which makes it difficult because that one or two applications that um, then uh, are reviewed by biochemists or molecular biologists or whatever, they just get lost. So, um, for example, for myself in Holland, we've been fortunate enough to. Um, yeah, to have a program where psychology or psychosocial topics were high on the agenda. Um, and um, that has been really helpful. Um, at the same time, um, funds like the Diabetes UK, I imagine, and the Diabetes Research Foundation in the Netherlands and in Germany and elsewhere, they are having in increasing difficulty of raising uh, money. Um, and um, so... Yeah, it's difficult to um, to get funding. At the same time, I think I can say that those projects that have been funded in the past years, both in Europe and across the Atlantic, um, most of them are outstanding and, and have produced significant results. I do believe that it should, it, it could, it should have been much more, uh, but due to limited resources. Um, and sometimes, uh, and this includes myself, uh, we work with funding from the pharmaceutical companies who in the past decades have also increasingly shown interest in this area, uh, be it for um, obvious marketing reasons. Um, that doesn't mean that we cannot work together on, um, on a very uh, honest and, and uh, open um, basis. So we have a combination of uh, sponsoring from national health institutes, um, medical councils, as well as uh, research foundations and pharmacy. And the third part of the mission statement was to stimulate the implementation of effective psychosocial interventions in diabetes care. How far do you think you've come with that one? Yeah, that's very different across the world, I must say. So in some areas, and I guess the UK and the Netherlands, Western Europe is pretty fortunate in having a mental health uh, service in place, while in other parts of the world there's nothing or virtually nothing, um, let alone something specifically for people with diabetes. I think the challenge that we're facing now is that we've developed, we, I mean, in, in the sense that our, from our field, um, various effective psychological interventions for people with diabetes have been developed um, getting them implemented, disseminated is a challenge, um, partly because of reimbursement, uh, partly because of um, the need to have psychologists in place in 
the healthcare setting, which is not always the case. Uh, so you don't have the ambassadors, you don't have the people who can feel responsible for actually carrying it out. But um, with the introduction of, of digital therapies, I think there is, um, well, it makes me a little bit more optimistic. I think we can uh, overcome a lot of these physical barriers as well as uh, monetary barriers um, because of the um, the possibility of having a wide reach at low cost by using internet therapy. Of course, there are downsides, but I think that's going to be really helpful, particularly for uh, a disease that is so global and so uh, epidemic. Has the um, focus of the P PSAD evolved in any way over the past 25 years? Yes, the, I think the focus has shifted from measurement so assessment and developing questionnaires, tools, uh, the psychometric part of that, very important, to more um, interventions, um, programs, and um, and to, an, to some extent more basic fundamental research. Um, and with fundamental, I mean it's real uh, uh, research that's really uh, sometimes a mix of experimental and clinical, but actually trying to understand the mechanisms, the mediators and the moderators of the processes that are so important in, in, in behavior change, for example. So I think it's, um, yeah, it ha we're, we're deepening our understanding. Um, there's still a lot of issues um, to be resolved, but um, I think the shift, particularly what we've seen in the past decades, is from, from measurement per se, having a tool, to actually using the tool and making it um, part of interventions. How can you see it shifting over the next sort of five to ten years? Well, as I, as I alluded to, I think one of the shifts we will see is um, uh, developing and in disseminating interventions for larger audiences, uh, particularly using digital therapies, but also um, developing and disseminating interventions for underserved uh, populations. Uh, I think that's one of our major challenges is how do we make these psychological interventions available and appropriate for that matter uh, to people living in other parts of the world and or even in our part of the world but who come from a different part of the world and have different cultures and languages. So that's something I think we uh, we should be looking into and actually we are looking into that. Um, and um, I think what we see in a more broader sense is that where uh, in the past the health psychology, looking at populations, looking at behavior change, looking at risky behaviors like smoking, um, overweight, etc., on the one hand, and the more clinical psychologists working in hospitals on the other side, I can see that distinction uh, uh, blurring. It's, it's the, the health psychologists and the clinical psychologists are working more and more closely together, covering that whole spectrum from prevention to treatment. And uh, I think that is a, a major advance compared to the past, where these were separate compartments, so to speak. Um, you've alluded already to differences between different countries when it comes to their interest in a psychosocial side of diabetes care. And what what do you think drives these differences? Well, that's a tough question. Um, well, I think it's partly explained by um, culture, healthcare systems, the way that healthcare is organized. Um, it's interesting that, for example, in uh, countries like France and, and southern countries, the more psychiatric approach, psychoanalytic approach is still very, um, very strong. While in the UK and Denmark and Holland, for example, we have a more behavioral uh, perspective, um, uh, less psychiatry, more health psychology, I would say. Um, and yeah, there, there are many factors of, uh, obviously uh, involved, including the, um, the level of affluency, uh, how, how rich a country is and what they can uh, afford. Um, I think in, in, uh, in very general terms, I say that uh, Western countries have been very quick with the uptake of, of, 
uh, behavioral science in diabetes care, while in Eastern European countries that has been much slower, probably because they had more basic problems, in just supplying, just offering care to um, large numbers of people um, and having a great difficulty setting up a, a healthcare system. Um, and um, I can see that these differences are uh, getting smaller, um, um, probably as part of the globalization, um, which I think has as its advantage that much of what has been developed as and typically termed as Western European is now uh, more available and being tailored to the needs of people in other countries in other settings. Um, finally, how successful do you feel you've been in reaching out to diabetes specialists who may not have a specific interest in the psychosocial side of care? Well, that's a difficult question to answer in general terms. I know that um, I'm proud and, and, and happy that in my local situation, for example, I was fortunate enough to work with a team of specialists who were highly interested in psychology. And I know the same is true for, for different pockets, so to speak, around the world. Um, so to say how successful uh, have I been or have we been as a group, I think it's, it's something we're working on continuously. Um, but not all um, endocrinologists or diabetologists are open to this or um, are very open to this. I mean, it's true that I come across, very rarely do I come across clinicians who say no to psychology <laughs> as, as a sort of uh, attitude. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's our job to make them aware uh, of the opportunities, of the possibilities, and um, actually to support the clinicians, and that also includes the nurses and the dietitians, to support them in their work. They're in the in the front line, so to speak, and um, we should not make it more difficult. We should try to make their life more easy, and to develop interventions that fit the healthcare system. Um, so I, I think we're we're moving towards that. Uh, we're moving in that direction. Um, and it's it's something we have to continuously work on, the awareness and also to show the evidence. So that's why I'm so pleased that we have this special issue in diabetic medicine as a showcase for 25 years of psychosocial research in diabetes. Um, what about at the major conferences in terms of being able to engage with um, other professionals? Yeah, as I alluded to earlier, the, 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 the ES, ESAD has always been a challenge and probably will be a challenge in the coming years. The ADA is very open to this and they have a, a stream every day and we see this happening more and more. And um, together with this uh, appreciation of the behavioral side, we also see a, a strong involvement of the patients themselves. So um, in, in recent years, um, larger conferences um, Almost uh, without exception, they have uh, presentations by patients or mixed presentation, patients and clinicians. And I think um, this also directly links to psychology, the behavioral side. We're talking about quality of life. We're talking about uh, the impact of diabetes, the social uh, consequences, etc. So I think, um, we're, again, as I said earlier, we were moving in the right direction and uh, Obviously, it's, it's also up to us to submit good proposals for symposia, to submit high quality uh, abstracts, um, and that will help us further, I believe. Thank you to Frank Schnook, and thank you for listening to this podcast produced by Medwire News for Medicine Matters Diabetes. Please subscribe for more, and don't forget to visit diabetes.medicinematters.com for news, expert opinion, and practical advice about caring for people with diabetes.